uh, three to four. It should be working now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm using the polycom mic. It's fine. I've got it set correctly, so you can see. And then chat said the only students can hear, and if you can hear them. And checking the speaking. It worked. Okay. Great. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hey guys. Why don't you all move over here so that I don't, I'm not turning quite so far to speak to everyone. You can close your computers if you want. You can, um, you can uh, put away your notes. We're going to be having a different kind of conversation today. Um, Thanks, guys. I, I appreciate you all being willing to do that for me. Um, it's come to my attention from the administration that some of you guys are still confused about um, the things that I had to say about Professor Owusu's book. Good afternoon. Um, and I guess what really, you know, the thing that I'm really concerned about here is that I'm learning about this from the administration. Um, and I'm not sure what I've done to uh, convince you guys that you can't talk to me. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know how to to sort of fix that, uh, except to say that you guys can ask me anything, right? In the icebreaker, you were given the opportunity to ask me anything. And some of you guys asked some really interesting questions. An awful lot of you asked, how do I get an A in the course? Which, fine, it's a legitimate question. Makes me a little sad, but you know, uh, that's a whole different issue. Um, but if I say something and you aren't sure what it means, I really hope that you guys will ask me. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you can't talk to the administration. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying that I, uh, I was a little surprised. And I want to sort of explain why I was surprised and then um, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that I've learned after sort of getting over my surprise. Um, and that's, you know, from my perspective, this is what happened. I, I'm reading Professor Owusu's book to try and prepare for class. And I am doing this because I am not already uh, knowledgeable and expert on the particulars of Caribbean property law. I know 
more or less the generic issue of uh, common law property, in particular how it has developed in the United States, but I don't claim to know the ins and outs of Barbadian and Jamaican and St. Lucian property law. And so I'm trying to learn in order to help you guys learn. And I'm finding Professor Owusu's book difficult. And, you know, if I'm finding it difficult, I am sure that some of you are as well. And I make a comment in class sort of off the cuff, hey, this book is, is hard. It's, you know, it's not great for, for a classroom because it's, it's hard. Um, and a couple of you email me and say, hey, can you explain what you mean by that? Um, and one of the things that I have learned in my years of teaching is that if one student asks a question, there's probably 10 others who have the question that are scared to ask. Um, and so I send out uh, my thoughts and, you know, as I've said on numerous occasions, I, I come from an American academic context where nothing that I said in that email or the way in which I said it would have been in the least bit remarkable. Right, nothing about any of that would have caused anyone uh, to bat an eye. Um, and so I, I hope you can understand how surprised I was when the administration says to me, um, you have, you know, you've, you've really offended some people with this and, and this is not okay. And so I, I'm telling you all of this, not to tell you that you have to see the situation in the way that I did, okay? Your responses to this, whether you are one of the students who did email me in response and said, oh, thank God, I thought I was the only one, or whether you're one of the students who read this and went, um, you know, I. I don't understand how, how Dr. Krell can say these kinds of things, right? Both of those are valid reactions. And both of those deserve to be taken seriously. So here I am taking this seriously and telling you um, what I have learned. So, I stand by what I said about the problems with the book. And here's why these problems are an issue in the classroom, right? You are all in the process of learning. I am in the process of learning. Unclear text, right? Text that is, is does not, uh, provide as its main mission, making it easy is perhaps unsurprisingly difficult, right? It requires more thought. It requires more engagement for the same amount of learning because you have to puzzle out what is being said before you can take in the knowledge that is being, that is being handed to you. And I think that one of the things that we should keep in mind as lawyers and as future lawyers is that the judges that you will appear in front of um, will never, sorry, something came up on my computer and I wanna be able to see the Zoom. Um, the judges that you appear in front of will never know as much about your case as you do. And so, they are learners too when they are reading your writing. And, and so this is why, right, one of the things that I make mention of in my comments about Professor Owusu's book is 
how this style of writing would be received in American courts. And this is because of a particular aspect of the American judicial system where American courts have decided that docket management is really important. They want to move cases through and get them done. And the judges never have enough resources, never have enough time. And so if you come in and your writing isn't clear, most American judges will simply assume that you shouldn't win and they will move on to the next case. And so that is what prompted that commentary. And I think, and you, you are welcome to disagree, I think that even you know, elsewhere in the common law system, there are norms you know, in the Caribbean, in Israel, in uh, the UK, the norms are more along the lines of judges are expected to engage with the case, even if that means that cases move more slowly. But even in those systems, it seems to me that all else being equal, being clear is better than being obscure. Um, you know, it seems to me that that would be better for you, better for the court, and most importantly, better for the client. Um, that said, what is not okay? What is not okay? Was that I suggested that Professor Owusu would struggle in American courts or that he would be forced into an area of practice that is not writing intensive. Because the truth of the matter is, is that Professor Wusu learned his craft in a particular context, right? And I learned mine in a particular context. And so who am I to say that if we were to swap places, which of us would be more successful? So I didn't mean to suggest that lawyers trained in the Caribbean would struggle in the United States. But I think that's a, I think that's a reading of what I did say that fits. And I think that in particular, that sort of uh, commentary from a white man, a newcomer, an outsider is not okay. And I'm sorry for that. Um, but I also want to point out, right, one of the things that I said at, uh, towards the end of my, my email is that no book is perfect. And the flip side of that is that no book is irredeemable. Um, and in, in my email, I had been specifically asked to explain sort of the problems with Professor Owusu's book, um, and so I did. But it has its strengths as well, right? There is a reason why we are making fairly extensive use of it. And that reason is largely uh, because Professor Owusu's coverage of the topics that we are covering in this class is vastly more extensive than Professor Cotellini's. Um, and, you know, to some extent, some things in Professor Owusu's book may be over covered, right? Um, but if you're asking me, I will tell you that given a choice, I would rather, as a professor, have too much material in the book 
rather than not enough. Um, and so, because it's easy for me to say, don't read this. It's hard for me to say, oh, by the way, I have an ex I have more stuff you need to learn that's not in the book anywhere, right? So, and I'm sorry that that wasn't, that, that that was not part of what I said, right? You know, again, uh, one of the things that it's important for us to recognize when we are criticizing the work of others is to acknowledge the things that are done well, right? Um, it softens the sting of the critique a little bit. Even if the person we're criticizing isn't in the room, that's, you know, that's an important component of the conversation because there are people who, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Professor Roos's book, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about an article that I read when I was in graduate school, it, or whether we're talking, whether an, it's an article that I'm reviewing for a journal, right? someone who is listening finds value in the text that we're, we're criticizing. And that is something that I, uh, that I should have taken into account and didn't. And I'm sorry for that. Um, Sorry, I've been sent a, a message. So to the person who sent me that message, I'll, I'll respond when I get back to my office, okay? Um, uh, the, so one of the things that this is, that this whole kerfuffle has, has really driven home for me is that there is a wealth of opportunity here um, that I need to be paying more attention to. Um, and I'm really excited about that opportunity and the, uh, the attention that the, the way in which my attention has been drawn to the possibility of doing some really interesting work here. So, for example, let me tell you about my academic grandfather. What do I mean by my academic grandfather? There's a professor at the University of Alabama who supervised my doctoral research and we call that, that person is my academic father. And so his advisor is my academic grandfather. My academic grandfather is uh, a, a professor at the University of Texas by the name of H.W. Perry. And Dr. Perry uh, wrote a book in the early 1990s called Deciding to Decide. And it's about uh, the way in which the Supreme Court of the United States um, chooses the cases that they are going to hear. And what's, what's interesting about this, and the reason that I mention it, is that before Dr. Perry's book, we knew nothing about how the Supreme Court of the United States chose its cases because the justices do that, they make those decisions in a conference that only they attend and in which they keep no records except which cases they decide to hear. And any, any statements that justices make disagreeing with the decision on whether to hear a case. So we knew nothing about this process. Dr. Perry sat down with the justices. He's a 
29 year old graduate student at the University of Michigan. And he interviews the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States and he asks them what happens in their conference. And we never knew this before. And one of the things that we learn from this is that in addition to the rules that the court publishes that sort of talk about how the court uh, engages with cases, that there are all these informal norms that also play a role. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is the opportunity to sit down with judges at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the Court of Caribbean Justice or national high courts. Go down to the magistrate's court in Oystens down near where I live and find out how these judges handle their own work. And to talk about that with the whole world and to show the world how uh, learned and ingenious the legal systems of the Caribbean really are. Uh, and that's a really important lesson for me is this opportunity to, um, to bring the fruits of this culture and this civilization to a larger stage. Um, you know, political scientists outside the Caribbean don't talk much about the Caribbean. And I think that should change. And I'd like to change that. So um, the last thing that I want to talk about, and we're probably going to wind up a little early today. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about how you deal with difficult texts. Right, because the fact of the matter is that um, there's a lot of like hard writing out there and you will have to engage with it, right? You, you have to engage with Professor Owusu's book regardless of whether you find it difficult or not. And so how do you do that? How do you read this book? How do you glean knowledge from it? So a couple of strategies that I use that will be, that I, I think may be helpful to you. One thing, and this is not an option if you have gotten your book from the library. So let me just say this right now. Do not do this if your books came from the library. Is that you can write in the margins. Okay, you can uh, converse with the text. What does this mean? What about this other fact? You know, why does this matter? What are what am I supposed to take away out of this? And what I have found is that sometimes writing those sorts of things in the margins or on a separate pad, right, when the text later answers those questions, I can go, oh, I remember being confused about this. Now I've learned this, okay? And that, that allows me to make connections between pieces of the text that may not necessarily be apparent if my eyes are just scanning the words, okay? One thing, and I, I offer this sort of as, as a specific um, thing for Professor Wusu, but also more generally because 
writers do this, when text is in the passive voice, one of the things that happens um, you rate me i'm I'm not sure what that means bryce but i i uh, okay <laughs> okay uh, sorry you know uh I read a book once that described the United States and the United Kingdom as two countries separated by a common tongue. Um, and, and never have I felt that more keenly than uh, coming to the, to the Caribbean. And uh, you guys all understand me just fine. And boy, I feel so stupid <laughs> um, when I know you're all speaking English to me and I just can't understand sometimes. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you being understanding and granting me grace when I go, what? <laughs> um, and, and I hope you understand that it's not you, it's me. Um, so, uh, passive voice. One of the things that happens when authors use passive voice is it becomes difficult to discern who's acting. And so it may be helpful to sort of like draw yourself a little picture or so my high school English teacher hated passive voice, hated it. And, um, and would force us to revise any sentence that we wrote that had a form of the verb to be. So I am, you are, he is, they are, right? We were, you know, any, any form of the be verb we would have to revise because she said that, that that was passive voice. As with most things, the truth is a little more complicated, but if when you see a be verb, am, is, are, was, were, right? Be, then, being. Um, if you stop or and at, or you read the sentence and it doesn't make sense and you see a, a be verb and you ask yourself, um, who's acting? So let me give you, let me give you an example. Okay. And this is not a specific example. I cannot give you page and, and line, but on any number of occasions, Professor Owusu says something along the lines of, um, uh, it is frequently argued that something, right, some statement of doctrine. The question you should be asking when you see something like that is, who's arguing? And that, you know, this isn't a criticism of Professor Owusu because lots of writers do this, okay? I do it sometimes. I actually, I literally have one of the reasons why I had a business partner when I was in practice was he would go through and he would fix all of my passive voice and he would remove all of my pop culture references. Um, every single one, uh, except for the one time where I put one in that was so obvious that he missed the more subtle one. <laughs> So, uh, the point being that um, reading strategies are intended to help you draw meaning from the text. And so, if you read the text and it doesn't make sense, right? First of all, you should not assume that the problem is with you. 
okay? The problem is almost always with the text. <laughs> um, and once, and, and then you should be asking yourself, what can I do to make this text clearer? So drawing yourself a diagram of who's doing what to whom with what, right? That can be helpful. Ask, you know, when there's no one acting in a sentence, asking yourself, who is acting here? That can be helpful, you know? Writing in the margins or on a notepad, you know, what am I supposed to, why am I supposed to know this? What is this telling me? Because a lot of times what authors like to do is they like to sort of build up the mystery of, of a question. And they, they take a couple of pages or a few pages telling you all the things that, that, could, be, that could be going on. And then they give you the answer. And, uh, and I do this myself in my own writing. Like literally, uh, I once got a comment from, from my advisor on a chapter of my dissertation where he said, just make the first sentence of this chapter your research question. Not revise the first sentence or change the research question to fit the first sentence. No, add a sentence at the beginning that says, this is the research question you are, you are analyzing here. Don't hide the ball. And this, and so this is something that I struggle with, with in my own writing. Um, and so I, I sympathize with authors that have problems with it. I sympathize with readers who struggle with those kinds of texts texts. Anyway, um, so I want to be clear that um, that if you're if you're troubled by the text, if you're having difficulty with the text, you can ask me. And you know what? I'm not promising that I will have an answer for you. Um, there, it's entirely possible that I will read the text that, that you're confused by and go, yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Um, but we'll puzzle it out together. Um, At the end of the day, right, at the end of, of the goal of the semester, the goal that we have for you guys is for you to be able to graduate from this university and enter into uh, the honored and noble legal profession. Um, and if I didn't think that every single word of that was true, I would not be here, including the honored and noble part. Uh, so I think that's everything that I have. Um, what I am going to do is I am going to post in uh, e-learning sort of a summary of what I've had to say today. So if you were not taking notes, that's fine. The key pieces of this are going to come into your inbox. Um, may not, I may not sort of go through all the details as, as thoroughly as I, I did with you guys, but um, I, I hope that we I hope that you understand me a little bit better now. Um, and I hope that um, I hope that you feel like you can 
come to me in the future if something that I've said has confused you, has left you wondering what to make of, of this, uh, of anything. And so, um, yeah. Uh, if there are any questions, I will take them. Um, otherwise, you're free to go. Yes, Chris. Spoken like a true academic. <laughs> every every academic hates the the person in Q and A who goes. So this is more of a comment than a question. I'm sorry. I'm I'm teasing. Go ahead. On the prepaid, this is my friend, whoever did this, I was not talking. But um, I believe that you're doing a really good job. You have been doing a really good job. Yes, there are like some things lost in translation, but you're always willing. If you send an email or if it comes to you after class and you ask, you will send it. The phone will always be not able to answer a question so that you're not really getting what they say. Well, by all means, continue puffing up my ego. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm really sorry um, that whoever decided to do this very stupid act. No, I, <laughs> no. Let me let me stop you right here. Whoever did this did nothing wrong. Okay, you are absolutely within your rights to ask the administration for clarification on anything. What I hope will happen in the future is that you will come to me first and give me an opportunity to give you that clarification, but you are under no obligation to do so. And I want to be very clear about that. Okay. So I, I, I appreciate your kind words, Chris, I really do, but I don't want anybody thinking that, uh, that I'm, angry with them or upset with them or uh, or that they did something wrong, okay? Um, so I, I just, uh, and so I, I want to be clear about that. Um, and I, I appreciate, I see all of your kind words in the chat and I really appreciate them. Um, I really do, uh, but this is not about you guys puffing me up, okay? This is, this is about me making sure that those of you who, uh, those of you who don't agree with the students who, the, those of you who were upset, who were offended, that you understand the broader context and that you feel like you have been heard and that uh, you, have, you have received redress, okay? So, thank you. Uh, and so I appreciate that. Again, any other questions? If not, you're free to, you're free to go. Monique, did you have a question or? Okay. Afternoon, sir. Yes, Not go ahead. a question, but coming from an island where we're hardly given any opportunities, and then you come to UE and it's a mix and match school. So you meet a lot of different people, and there's always going to be a problem in relaying certain information in that we take different things to mean the complete opposite. But there are certain lecturers who have never even given this space for us to express ourselves and come to them on the same level as if we're all humans and interact with them. And so you've given us that platform. So yes, the person went about it the wrong way and it was their right to seek information. But at the same time, we're not trying to puff you up. We're just trying to let you know that not every lecturer has made us feel respected. And we really appreciate that you give us this grounds that we can come to you and speak to you and gain better understanding because there's no better way to learn than being comfortable. And we really appreciate the way that you interact with us and 
even on the first class, I was so amused at the examples that you gave us and how you correlated it to your culture and your backgrounds. And most lecturers don't give you a personal history so that you feel that you can relate to them. And it is really, really appreciated that you do that for us. So thank you very much. And I just wanted you to know that majority of the class feels that you do a great job and that we are just appreciative of the fact that you see us on a level as a human. Thank you. But I... <laughs> Thank you. Uh... I, I don't mind telling you that this has been, this has weighed on me for some time. Um, you know, this is, uh, I take seriously, and I, I think that, that you can tell that I take seriously uh, the privilege of being able to teach you. Um, and I, the notion that I had, um, uh, overstepped and that I had upset or offended some of you, um, and I knew it wasn't all of you because I knew there were a few of you who responded to my email and, and like I said, said, oh my God, I thought I was the only one who felt this way. Um. So I knew it wasn't everyone, um, but the notion that I had uh, offended any of you was was troubling, um, and so I really I I I mean it when I say I do appreciate the kind words and and the reassurance um, and. You know, everything, Tiffany, everything that you say is how I try and uh, be as a lecturer. Um, you know, I'll tell you this story, uh, sort of how I became like this, because once upon a time, I was one of these uh, professors who was like, you know, learning is your job, you know, I'm, I'm here, they really just pay me to grade. Um, blah, 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 that sort of thing, da, 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 you know, rigor, 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 blah, blah, blah. And a friend of mine who um, was a, a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, and she was a history student, and she said to me, um, you know, we're in a system that wants to grind us up into dust and turn us into cogs in the system. She said, you know, in that kind of system, being, being kind is a radical act. You know, and if you take seriously the notion that, um, and, and I try to, if you take seriously the notion that uh, we should be breaking down unjust systems and building them up in a fairer and juster way, then I don't see any other way that you can that you can be. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's all I've got for today. Um, again, still got a few minutes, so I'm I'm open to questions. Uh, always at home for compliments. Um, but but in all seriousness, uh, I'm. I want you guys to feel comfortable and safe coming to me, and if you don't, 
I want to know what I can do to fix that. So. So. With that, you're free to go. So. And Tricia is correct that there will be circums there will be times where you don't get the kind of grace that uh, that I try to give to you and that you have given to me. Um, but uh, you know, if you'll pardon my French, why the hell can't we do it? Why can't we build a world where that's the, the norm and expectation? That's what I want. I hope that that's what you want. So. Oh, you don't have to stay here or stay. You, know, you can sit and stare at each other for another few minutes. <laughs> My pleasure, Michaela. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you for your time. It hurts you so far. And I hope this doesn't deter you because at the end of the day, you get your understanding. You're here. So that's why when you went to the hospital the last time, I still came to class the next day was being a public to know that you're really invested in this. And you're going to always have students like that. You're going to support with the volunteering for our students. I say thank you for what you do. Thank you. So enjoy gonna... the rest Yeah. Oh yeah. Go? Yes. Go. Yes. Thank you. Do have a good day, and I feel as a whole life. Shalom Alechem to your daughter as well, Trisha. And I'm going, the next class is coming in, so I'm going to turn off the Zoom. So, see you guys next week. <laughs>